Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. The start of this year brought some big changes to Croatia. It became the 20th and newest member of the Eurozone and the 27th member of the Schengen Free Travel Area. For pro-EU elites and for many Croats, the entry into the single currency and into Schengen are major landmarks. In the 1990s, Croatians were at war. Now they're firmly part of the European political family. My guest has steered Croatia in this European direction since he became Prime Minister nearly seven years ago. Andrei Plenković heads the Conservative HDZ party. He won general elections in 2016 and in 2020, and he's now the longest-serving Prime Minister since Croatia became independent from the former Yugoslavia. Uh, he joins me from Zagreb. Prime Minister, thank you so much for being my guest. Uh, if we could start with this transition from uh, the Kuna, your national currency to the euro. Uh, we've seen some problems of businesses uh, hiking prices, which is something that was predicted. Um, you've uh, threatened punitive measures against uh, uh, traders who are doing that. Um, do you think in the light of that, the transition could have perhaps been uh, planned a bit better and some of these abusive practices could have been prevented? Well, first of all, I'm very proud and honoured that we have managed to attain two strategic objectives of uh, my government, my first and my second government, and which were clearly set in the uh, electoral manifesto back in 2016 when I said that uh, three years after the time membership in the European Union, we joined on the 1st of July 2013, with that we wanted to join two deeper integrations, one Schengen area and the other one Eurozone. So finally, we are the only country ever to join both deeper integrations on the same day, on the 1st of January 2023. It was a historic achievement. It was well prepared. Technically, we had enough coins, we had enough banknotes. All the banking machines uh, were, cash machines were functioning perfectly. There was no problem with the system of payments in terms of digital transfers. Everything was fine. The banks were prepared. The special agencies who were in charge, charge were prepared. The whole process was transparent, and I have to admit that we were one of those countries in, in 2022 that heavily helped our businesses and our citizens the aid to those most socially vulnerable, to pensioners, to farmers, to fishermen, to unemployed, to war veterans, to those who were giving the, the child, having the child benefits, uh, lowering and regulating the prices of electricity, of gas, of um, uh, um, oil in terms of uh, super or diesel, whatever you consume. So what happened, if I may be very precise, just to give you the context, that some of the economic operators used the context of the inflatory pressure in 2022 and simply didn't go into the precise change of the exchange rate between kuna to euro is the 1st of January, but started to round the prices and actually increase them for 10, 20, 30, some of them even 40 percent. This is an abuse of a object, strategic object, objective, and these were the gestures against the citizens, against the consumers. So our objective as a government was to tell them, uh, please step back. Put your prices back on the 31st of December. Do not amplify the inflatory pressures and do not behave in the mentality, which is not adequate to the status that the country, the government or the whole society has attained. So uh, we said that if they continue like this, we have several measures. One, we can decrease the subsidies or abolish them. We can introduce taxes or we, can, we might as well use the special laws that we have in order to force them to put uh, prices of their products or services to an earlier date in 2022. Let's move on to the, the question of Schengen, because now, of course, you've abolished uh, more than 70 border crossings with neighbours, uh, Italy, Austria, Slovenia and Hungary. Uh, what's been the practical impact of that? 
people are really thrilled about the fact that there are no more controls on the border crossings between Croatia and Slovenia, between Croatia and Hungary. 73 border crossings are now police-free, customs-free, no control. People pass uh, without any, any control when they go to Slovenia and Hungary. That means going to towards the west or the north of Europe. For us, this was a symbolic gesture that we are fully integrated into the core of the European Union, being among the 15 countries in the world which are members of NATO, EU, Schengen and Euro areas. So you could see even with the images that you are um, now uh, presenting to your viewers that this was really a great occasion for those who are living in the cross-border context but most of all it's less costs, it's more tourists coming to Croatia during the summertime. We are one of the tourist destinations. 82 overnight, 82 percent of overnights of tourists in Croatia are actually done by citizens of the Schengen and area countries. So for us, this is going to be a huge economic benefit and we finally feel uh, fully entrenched, entrenched into the European family. Is there a, a flip side in terms of more tensions uh, on non uh, on the borders with non-Schengen uh, countries, Serbia, Montenegro and Bosnia-Herzegovina? Is that something you're expecting? No, no. What what we witnessed was simply that last weekend was the weekend when the holidays ended, whether it was the holidays and, and, and school holidays for kids for Catholic uh, Christmas or Orthodox Christmas, and many of the workers who are working in Western Europe were going back from the countries of Southeast Europe, and obviously they had to find pass now the external Schengen border. But in normal days, we don't see a problem. On the contrary, most of our neighbors are happy that Croatia has followed suit after Slovenia and is one of the countries that has fully now been integrated into the European Union. We shall be guarding the external Schengen border as we did uh, you very efficiently guard the external EU border. Now the responsibilities are higher and everything seems to be in the best order. I want to say that our example and our advances should be an incentive and a good example for other countries of Southeast Europe. Uh, uh, Prime Minister, you're a staunch supporter of Ukraine. You, you wanted Ukraine to be given EU candidate status last year. Uh, but uh, MPs in the Croatian parliament seem to think differently because in December they rejected a plan for Croatia to help to train Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, why, why is there this difference between you and the parliament? Well, it's not between me and the parliament or the government and the parliament, but it is an issue of the parliamentary majority and parts of the opposition. We are governing uh, with 77 MPs out of 151 in total. When we wanted to pass this decision through the parliament, the majority that we were supposed to obtain was two thirds, which is 101. So literally for your viewers to understand, I needed to get 24 votes from the opposition parties, whether being from far right or being from the left. We got only 20, so we got 97 out of 151, which was not sufficient. Some of the parties that didn't vote in favor of Croatia's participation in the European Union um, military assistance mission to Ukraine, they will have to respond why they voted against or they didn't vote. Why didn't they enable Croatia to be as literally almost all other members of the European Union who are participating in this mission and helping. The absurd element is that Croatia has already, besides political, diplomatic, economic, humanitarian aid or technical, given an extensive military assistance to Ukraine and uh, training of Ukrainian soldiers in Croatia or participation of our officers and, and trainers in parts of the mission which will take, be taking place in Germany or in, or in Poland, not in Ukraine, could have been a, a real a modest contribution to what we have already done so far. So I think this was a political stunt of those forces, political forces in Croatia, who will bear this historic mischoice or a very bad choice for a very long time. And we will not hesitate to tell them this on every occasion. It's not our responsibility, but of those 54 that failed to vote right and to be on the right side of history, morale, justice and solidarity with Ukraine in a moment when their vote was really counting. We'll have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we're run, we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Prime Minister Andrei Plenkovic of Croatia, joining me on this programme from Zagreb. Do stay with me. I'll be back in a few minutes after the news with part two of our Talking Europe programme.